Uh, welcome back to Talking Tax with Tom. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And uh, we have Tom Yamachika joining us here on a given early morning. And we're going to talk about uh, the $600 million that went to DHHL, which is now going to be led by Ikaika Anderson, which is very interesting. Um, so welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks for having me, Jay. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about um, the $600 million that was appropriated to our Department of Hawaiian Homelands uh, to reduce the monstrous waiting list of Hawaiians waiting for homestead lands. Uh, the, the catch, however, is that DHHL needs to spend the money or encumber it uh, by June 30th of 2025. Uh, otherwise, the money goes poof back to the mm -hmm. general fund. Uh, we have uh, provisions in our you know, in our Organic Act and governing laws uh, that talk about, you know, homesteads for the Native Hawaiians, which, you know, the United States kind of took over. The idea is for the state government to uh, establish programs to get uh, Native Hawaiians back on the land. And, and, they, and they do that by, uh, among other things, developing uh, things called Hawaiian homestead lands, uh, they have some like in Waimanalo and, um, uh, you know, on, on many of the neighbor islands. And uh, they lease these homestead lands to uh, eligible beneficiaries, you know, Native, Native Hawaiians with a certain blood quantum uh, for a dollar a year. And effectively, uh, you know, putting them on the land. Now, um, uh, obviously, this this program has had uh, you know, lots of people who, you know wanting to uh, to do this, uh, but uh, it's been a problem getting the lands developed and ready for occupancy. So there is a, a waiting list of, of tens of thousands of people uh, waiting to get on these homestead lands, and people have died on the waiting list because they wait they wait uh, you know three years, five years, ten years, more than ten years. Yeah, it's... Well, um, but, okay, but you know, we we didn't give mm, six hundred million the year before, the year before that. All of a sudden, in twenty twenty two, six hundred million dollars. What were the circumstances by which we, you know, allocated that much money in that year? Because there was there were issues about it. You know, hey, six hundred million dollars. Yeah, uh, of why, course. Why I mean, now? Why that much? Why now? Because we have the money. <laughs> we we had a lot of money coming in from the federal government. Uh, we have a budget surplus. Uh, you've you've heard a lot, I think, in the uh, in the campaigns this past November about uh, the budget surplus and what to do with it. But this is one thing they did with it. Hmm. Okay. Well, how how political is this? Is this a a big political issue, or is this something that you know happens as a matter of course? Well, I mean, I think there's a recognition that the Native Hawaiians had been kind of uh, repressed by legislat legislatures in the past, that, that DHHL's uh, mission was, you know, shunted to the background. Uh, and, you know, and, and this, this is a, uh, a problem we see uh, with state legislatures around the nation that have uh, Native Americans in there. Uh, they, they face you know similar issues, uh, but you know we have uh, we we have our own set of unique circumstances around uh, our Native Hawaiians and and how we deal with them in the United States of America. Mm. Uh, okay, well, um, and now what, now what about uh, management? You know, I, my recollection is there uh, there have been issues around management uh, over recent years. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, In in recent years, uh, there's been you know issues with you know spending the uh, the money that was appropriated to the you know to, to the department. The uh, the department had control of you know special federal grants uh, that had been you know of course appropriated in Congress, um, and they they used to be like around like nine nine or ten million dollars a year. Uh, but uh, we couldn't spend them. We, we couldn't spend the money fast enough. 
So we, we, uh, didn't, we didn't spend it. Yeah, we didn't spend the money fast enough. Uh, in 2016, the uh, federal, you know, the Trump administration had enough, and they said, "Okay, fine. You don't want to. You don't want our money. We won't give any to you." So, so the in, the allocation went uh, down to zero. Um, and uh, our uh, uh, representatives in Congress went nuts, uh, and uh, we were successful at reinstating some of it uh, to the tune of I think three, three, four million dollars a year, and um, that that I think is something that's now ramping up. But 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 still, we need to uh, make sure that the agency is able to do something with the money that it's been allocated. And, and that 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 kind of lies uh, therein lies the problem. So how can an agency that's had trouble spending just ten million dollars a year in the past, uh, you know, swallow six hundred million dollars in three years? Uh, that that's kind of a tall order. So they had to come back with a strategic plan, which which they did. They just um, published that earlier this month, and. In that plan, they said, hey, in order for us to be able to do this, we have to have some law changes. And they um, listed some law changes, some that uh, sound obvious, some that, that don't, but all of which give us an idea, I think, of why or, or how uh, the... Uh, supply of affordable housing uh, is roadblocked here in the state of Hawaii. So let me let me kind of go through what they asked for and uh, we'll see you know if that's something that the legislature can deliver to them this legislative session. Okay, so we're so far as a wish list. Yeah, and and they have they have draft bills going in. Okay. Okay. Um, because they, they can't solve all of this administratively. Okay, one of the things that they uh, have asked for uh, is, you know, they want their developments of homestead lots or housings to be exempt from our general excise tax. They've asked for this before. Uh, it seems to dovetail into, um, you know, the existing exemptions we have for affordable housing. Uh, because this is, you know, Hawaiian homestead housing is similar to affordable housing in a lot of ways. But how does so, that work? What what exactly, what cash flow would be exempt? Um, the cash flow that goes to the developers or the contractors or the people who are uh, building these uh, uh, either affordable houses or DH DHHL homestead lots. Um, they would be exempt on the services that they uh, contribute to the project. Okay, can you connect for me why an exemption from the gross excise tax would help them spend the six hundred million dollars they um, that that they are challenged to spend? Well, I mean, you're right; it goes the other way, right? Um, but the but the uh, but they want to make sure the agency wants to make sure that the that the dollars uh, that the legislature has appropriated go you know as far as they can, and uh, it, you know I mean it's it's one thing if they get six hundred million dollars to spend and they and they and they can spend it, uh, and it's another if uh, you know twenty four million of the six hundred million has to go back to the general fund in general excise taxes. As Martin Pence in the federal court used to say when an argument um, was not entirely persuasive, um, he would say, next. <laughs> <laughs> this one uh, is probably more relevant to the, the line of thought that you're thinking of. They've, they've asked for uh, the ability to assume uh, the review uh, of any proposed project on historic properties or burial sites uh, for lands under its jurisdiction. Um, currently, 
any property with, you know, the, the proposed development on property with this kind of issues uh, has to go to the uh, State, Hawaii, State of Hawaii uh, Historic Preservation Division in DLNR. Uh, and they have a uh, remarkable uh, multi-year level of backup. So uh, I think the uh, DHHL sees this and somewhat rightly, I think, as a, uh, as a, uh, as an existential issue, you 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 need to solve the uh, the permitting delay problem, or you, or you can't get stuff done. Mm, that sounds pretty good, that one. But it also sounds reminiscent of the problems we've had in other areas for other projects, for most projects at the Department of Planning and Permitting, where um, what did I see recently that the average uh, processing time for a new family, a single family home is 347 days. <clears throat> which is yeah, one of the long things long. that DHHL didn't ask for um, was the ability to, to, to take, take over uh, regular permitting reviews from the counties. Mm. Uh, uh, I guess they thought that, that it wasn't politic of them to... Uh, you know, take away the zoning and planning functions from the counties. Yeah, okay. What I'm saying is that we, we, we the state, um, in many different areas and projects, seem to have a problem with uh, providing timely uh, permits. And so you know, the second point you mentioned sounds to me like it's a really good one. And um, it will save time and thus um, you know, make it easier uh, to uh, actually spend the money. Right. The, the next bill is, to me, a little bit more questionable. Uh, it proposes that DHHL be given authority to issue temporary administrative rules uh, having the force and effect of law for up to 18 months without complying with current requirements to give public notice, have a public hearing, and have the governor sign off on the rules as long as DHHL con consults uh, with its beneficiaries, i.e. lessees, applicants, Native Hawaiians. Now, um, certain, certain agencies already do have uh, temporary rulemaking authority. Department of Tax is one of them. Okay. Um, their statute allows um, for the Department of Tax to promulgate uh, temporary admin administrative rules uh, to be effective no longer than 18 months. Uh, but there are a lot of procedural requirements behind them, and the governor still has to sign off. Mm -hmm. um, this, this, seems to, uh, um, this seems to me to be uh, creating an exception uh, from the administrative procedures in the state. Uh, well, of course. And um, and why why exactly? I mean, you can you can have the exceptions uh, swallow up the rule after a while. The real problem here is not the exception so much as the way the Administrative Procedures Act works. And again, again, may I say, um, this is um, bureaucracy at its very best. Um, if we are going to say that a DHHL needs an exception um, to a, a sluggish bureaucracy administrative procedures, um, then why don't we fix the administ administrative procedures for everyone? Sure, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Uh, right now, one of the things that delay a lot of the uh, administrative rules is uh, like when rules go to the governor's office for um, for approval, uh, it sounds like it's it could be a relatively easy process, uh, but there are a number of sub requirements that have been layered on over the years. Um, one of them is that the the rules have to be reviewed by the uh, uh, the small business um, regulatory review board, uh, and it's a in a group of volunteers that meets just once a month. Uh, and 
uh, there are inherent delays in bringing stuff before a board that meets just once a month. Mm. It also needs to be reviewed by, uh, I believe, budget and finance and one more agency. Uh, I forget which one it is, but uh, it's not. I mean, the, the the way the governor's office has interpreted, you know, it, its approval requirement uh, gets a lot of other agencies and other processes involved, which uh, could be ripe for streamlining. Yeah, well, well that, could I say that might be an understatement? Um, could be? How about should be? How about should immediately be? Um, you know, it seems to me that we have layered on your term um, these additional bureaucratic requirements over years and we never take them off. And we have this um, organization, which is, it may be very non-expert, which meets uh, once a month, is, just slows it down. So it's, this is an example, in my view, of where the, the perfect overcomes the good. Um, even if the result is good, you... you you have so many negatives with the delay that it ain't worth it. And I, I think somebody has to get in there. I, maybe the Josh Green administration can do this and, 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 and lead, lead the charge on cleaning up this kind of um, bureaucratic delay that has slowed us down and slowed our economy down and slowed progress down over so many years. It has to be cleaned up. So the administrative rules that the DHHL, um, you know, would like to see the administrative changes they'd like to see adopted could be um, um, for everyone, or well, the, the improvements could be for everyone. Uh, but the, the problem, just to take off on that, the problem is it's really hard to do reform. It's really hard to do the cleanup because you have to really figure it out. Um, you have to look at every step that the individual applicant has to take and evaluate that and uh, either uh, change it or delete it. In a funny way, Tom, you know, the changes that DHHL might seek are actually a bellwether of changes that could be considered um, for all of these projects, not just DHHL. Yeah, absolutely. Be. I mean, that, that's one reason I think why we're looking at these uh, legislative proposals today, not as, you know, is this best for DHHL, but as, look, these are the bottlenecks that our own state government has identified as inhibiting uh, the process, you know, the, the, the progress of development. Um, it has identified, you know, many of the sources of the inordinate delays in the current process. And uh, really, it's, I think, um, helping to spoke out where the big problems are and, and, and where we really need the reforms. Yeah, good. I'm glad we're doing this. I'm, I'm glad that we're covering this topic. Um, okay, anything more on the changes in the administrative rules? Um, just a speculation here. Uh, I had earlier remarked that DHHL did not ask for a blanket exemption from county zoning and permitting requirements, uh, as some Hawaiian groups are advocating. But uh, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, perhaps this administrative rulemaking authority uh, can be used to end run uh the you know the county zoning and permitting processes all, all they have to do you know once you know if they get this temporary rule making authority uh is promulgate an administrative rule that says okay for the next 18 months uh we don't need no approval from no counties bye bye hmm. that's troubling in the sense that uh, uh dhhl builds homes so if you have exemption from rules for 18 months and in that period you build a home, um, the effect of the exemption from the, the ordinary process lasts for the life of that home, which is way longer than 18 months. 
So I mean, you bake it in that way, and it doesn't sound like this is good government to bake in the exemption, which could be um, not only unfair but wrong. Yeah, I mean, I I think you know, there there are some guardrails guardrails that need to be built around this uh, interim administrative rules um, proposal. Yeah. Well, because um, it just it just seems to be a naked power grab at the moment. Yeah, yeah, it takes a lot of thought to do this sort of thing, but it it reflects the larger problem, and uh, somebody has to address the larger problem. Um, maybe this is the year where we do that. That would be a, a real step forward, not necessarily to benefit DHHL, but to benefit every state agency and everybody seeking uh, approval. And permitting. Yeah. No, I mean it it's certainly I think gives us the opportunity to uh you know target certain areas for reform uh and, and it really exposes uh you know where a lot of the you know not 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 the little delays but the big delays, the inordinate delays are coming from. Yeah, I think the media ought to cover this more this year. And um you know, put some encouragement on it. Okay, what's next? Well, I think we're at the end of our half hour, so um, uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover for the DHHL. Well, let's talk. Let's talk about the people. Let's talk about uh, Ikaika Anderson. Okay, uh, he is Josh Green's uh, selection for DHHL. Uh, he was in the city council for a while. Um, I know him. He's a very decent man. And uh, can can he, you know, you've described the timeline in which these initiatives, this plan, so to speak, strategic plan, has already been designed. And Ikaika Anderson is, you know, not yet in office. Or if he is, it's, it's just very, very recent, like within days. So uh, he has not been, presumptively, he has not been involved in designing this strategic plan we've been talking about. That's right. Uh, I mean, it was, it was orders? all... It's a challenge for him, isn't it? Well, uh, it's certainly true that it was all designed by the previous administration under um, uh, DJ, DJ Chill Director uh, Bill Isla. And, uh, uh, there's obviously going to be some uh, oh, what, what, what do I say some uh, adjustment uh, that, that may be required to accommodate uh, uh, Ika Anderson's uh, you know style and thinking and, and, and values um but I think for for the most part, the uh, the obstacles that the old plan has identified are are very real, and they and they need to be dealt with somehow if uh, DHL is, DHL is, is going to uh, deliver uh, some real reform in in uh, the Hawaiian Homestead uh, backlog. Yeah, you know, Todd, uh, DHHL, in my view, has not been successful over the years. It has not helped the Native Hawaiians. Uh, you talked about, um, you know, these um, lifelong waiting lists. And that's been the case as long as I can remember, the lifelong waiting list of a program that was designed years ago. And that, you know, f to the average observers, you know, if they have the money, let's do it. Let's get it done. Let's get them off the waiting list and build the homes and have them occupy the homes and so forth. It doesn't sound all that complicated. And yet there have been glitches and scandals over the years. And we're having a conversation about spending money now that, you know, the, the state has had on and off for years and years and years. And so here we are with $600 million, and that's good. Um, but it's not just spending the money. It's spending the money responsibly. It's getting those guys into these homes. 
And so uh, I, I suggest that Ikaika Anderson has his work cut out for him. But it's more oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, he's got to get clear of all the, what do you want to call it, baggage uh, that has been hanging on DHHL for all these years. Um, but it's more than that. It's more than Ikaika Anderson. It's state government in general. It's certainly the legislature dealing with this um, you know, strategic plan you mentioned. And it's the governor. Leadership is what we need. Uh, affirmative, thoughtful, powerful leadership. And so uh, Ikaika can't really do it by himself. He's got to have the governor behind him, encouraging him and uh, thinking with him about this. And together, they can approach the legislature and, and be effective. Hopefully, this is a time uh, when leadership will play out properly for a problem that we have had for generations. Well, or lots of problems. Yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, Tom Yamachika, we... We hit the most interesting problems on this discussion, and I know that a lot of people don't care about fiscal policy. Uh, they don't care about DHHL. They don't care about administrative rules. It sounds boring, but it's not. It defines our future time. So these discussions and the topics you pick are very important to everyone, and I hope they listen. Well, thanks for having me on the show, Jay. Thanks for being on the show, Tom. Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, here on Talking Tax with Tom. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.